Hey, what's up? Hello. How you doing? It's Ergo. It is indeed. I'm Kiss. I'm Damon. And what we do here is reshape the culture for the more liberatory and creative. What a mission. We've bitten off uh, perhaps more than we could chew, <laughs> but we feel like we're doing a pretty good job over here. Uh, yeah, what that looks like for us is long-form conversations with movement workers, artists, organizers, thinkers, musicians, people doing important political and culture work to build liberatory movements. And we got one for you today. I would say an artistic phenomenon, but at a deeper level, a truly genuine person, a loving and energizing presence in everywhere they go. We got Shawnee Dez. Oh, yeah. No, I would like Shawnee even if her music was bad. <laughs> and then the music's fantastic. The music is phenomenal. So we had the opportunity to chop it up with Shawnee a little while ago. We talked about the show she's done in the wake of her new project, Moody Umbra, which we've had the opportunity to experience and have been low-key life-changing. Uh, we talked about the community building work that she's done with the Black Joyride. Her brand new podcast with the Chicago Reader called The Sit Down with Shawnee Dez, which you should go subscribe to now. Man, everyone just has podcasts. Just making podcasts out here. Shout out. What up, squad? <laughs> <laughs> and we you know, got into what does it mean for her to start to really trust her voice, including the weirder parts of it musically. And, you Trusting know, we're, her body and movement. Exactly. You know. And the things that come out of that trust have been really, really beautiful. So we're excited to welcome Shawnee back onto the show. You can get Moody Umbro wherever you get music, maybe even buy it if you're a nice person and a good person. Mm -hmm. You can follow Shawnee at Shawnee underscore Des on Instagram. Follow us at Ergo Radio and at Respair Media. Subscribe, comment, review our work. Click the buttons. Just click the buttons, people. All we do all day as a society is click buttons. Click These a couple are more buttons. A couple for very the, particular buttons for, for us. Some good people. You know? <laughs> and uh, with that... Let's hop into it with Shawnee Dez. Let's do it. Here we go. I know what they say about me. When you face the truth, it's scary. It'll leave your lips wide open. What an honor, y'all. We have with us not only a homie, but just one of the most phenomenal artists, performers, writers, curator of people and space, and silly person. Silly, <laughs> silly, silly fun. Bringing the laughs. We have the one, the only, the illustrious. Shawnee Dez is with us. I love the I love the just bark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You made a cat noise. I said let's bring in the animals. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with no, that's you. what we're for. That's what it's about. You wanna hear my big cat? My my, my big Please wild cat. Show me. Show wow, wow, wow. Wow. That's actually really good. You I know, feel like surprisingly. You that daily. <laughs> I not daily. One day I just did it on here, and I was like, "Oh, I was like fucking around." I was like, "Oh shit, that was kind of better than I expected." And I, I've stuck with it. Whenever I need it, it's right there for me. It's just like an ancestral thing I got. Oh my god, I love it. It's, yeah, Black Panther. I don't yeah, know. There it is. There it is. Yeah, you got on a black shirt. You did it once, and then you were like, "All right, now this is a thing I do." This is a thing I do. This is yeah. a thing I do. This is I, me. But, but I don't pull it out every time. It's only not to take it to that, that next level. Depends um, on the crowd. Depends on the crowd. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start this thing the way we like to do, with a two-part question, and it's centered around time, and define time however you will. 
That could be this hour, this day, this season, or this lifetime. In this time, Shawnee Des, how is the world treating you and how are you treating the world? Mm, I love that. I'm going to stick with the shortest amount of time and I'm going to do like last 24. Yeah. You know, current events, I must say the world has been to me specifically in the way I'm moving through the universe. I feel like the world has been blessing me. I'm going to only stick with the last 24 because if I look too far out, it gets darker. And I don't want it to get dark. I mean, we all know darkness, though. We all know old friend darkness, old friend shadow. Um, But last 24, the world has been blessing me, just showing me the meaning of the turbulence, the meaning of the stillness, the meaning of the people that I've had the blessing to just be in community with or even just to let go. Like, literally, I had some of the craziest dreams last night of friends that I like low key broke things off with like, you know, friend breakups. And this morning I was like, you know what? I'm going to reach out and just check in. I'm going to still keep my space, but I'm going to check in because I really take the dream world seriously. Um, And then the way that I'm treating the world, you know, I'm trying to be present in the small sips of hope and joy that I have. And really putting that forward. So like trying to project that against all of the the darkness that is like seemingly all consuming as I even just stare out into the nothingness over there in the corner. So yeah, I feel like that's how I'm treating the world. I'm treating the world like I'm going to let this little light of mine shine because I know that there are moments where some entities in the world don't want that to be the case. And I... I can get real dark. Like it's super easy for me to snap into like a depression seriously. So I've had to grow and learn to be like vigilant in my joy and like feeling okay in my joy. Like sometimes joy can feel guilty, but I'm like, nah, I'm not going to let that, let that thought creep through. Was that too dark? No, 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 no. And even within the, the acknowledgement of shadow and darkness, I think you really centered the light. One thing you named coming out of that dream space that we, you know, we can steer clear of details. You can share as little as much as you like. But the the idea of friend breakups, I think, is really important. And I'm curious how that has gone for you since you named it. Were, were they explicit? Were they just like fadeaways? I know in relationships that I have that have been really important to me that I've distanced from, there, there really was not a hard like direct confrontational break, right? Like there was a knowing within me and then an acceptance, but still feeling some guilt, some shame, some like, you know, not being through the thick and thin. So I'm curious as has come up for you and you reached out to your ex, your friend exes. (laughs) Yeah. ex friend. Yeah. Um, Yeah. How's that sitting with you as much as you want to share about how that went, how you moved through that? Yeah. Well, I had this dream literally like this morning, last night type beat. So I haven't reached out yet, but I do plan to reach out today. And I think the breakup was, I was actually talking to a friend last night about how my new goal in terms of my practice is to be really acquainted with conflict and like, like standing. My therapist used to always say, Shawnee, sometimes you just got to stand in the fire. And I'm like, you know what? I can do this. I might get burnt the fuck up, but I can get in here. Okay. It's a hot tub. (laughs) It's a very understandable thing to try to avoid, though. Like, that is true. Sometimes it's necessary. But on its face, that is terrible advice. Stay away from the fire is like a very understandable instinct, you know? 100%. I think, like, it would be situations where... Some real Daenerys energy. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where it's like, I mean, it would always be things like really intimate relationships, right? So whether me and my sister were going at it or me and my mom, she would always tell me like, actually, Shawnee, you're going to be okay because I trust that you have the compassion and the language to say what needs to be said and to step away and to know that like, she would always tell me, you have to trust that adults are going to do what they need to do to like self-soothe and to be okay. 
because for me, a big issue was like, especially with friends and breaking up with friends or breaking up with romantic partners, things like that. I would always take on the anxiety and the feelings of like, oh my God, if I, you know, tell this person how I really feel, they're going to feel so sad. They're going to probably be depressed. They're going to, I was just like taking all that on and she would just have to tell me like, no, actually you can have hard conversations, especially if it's with people that you love and they claim to love you. And you have to trust that both you and them can do what they need to do to move through that. Because me doing the preliminary work for them, having not even had the hard conversation is pointless. So with that, to your question, this relationship was uh, explicit. It was like, I sent them a long message and was like, hey, you know, if we get time to talk in the future, I would be so down for that. But right now I don't have capacity to like really dive deeply into this. But at this moment in time, I need to take space from our friendship for X, Y, Z, you know? And so I feel like it was pretty fair in that I'm trying to, I, I'm an Aquarius moon. I love to ghost a motherfucker. Ghosting is second nature. It's so easy for, you know, that boy who just be faded out in the background. <laughs> that is me. <laughs> when you just slide through and you just, the opacity just go up. <laughs> That's me. And so I'm trying to practice like I can actually express how I feel and not just hold it in and blow up at the, you know, at a random time. And they're like, damn, you've been keeping tabs this long. Yes, I haven't forgotten anything. <laughs> you you didn't realize, but I have a ledger here the whole time and a stenography machine. And I've written down every quote and I've <laughs> recorded every single time I was shorted. And now it is time to present my results. Yeah, no, it's not ideal. Before we get too far, I just want to acknowledge that supreme use of opacity. Good job. But here's what I realized. <laughs> when, when you said it, people in relationships are like, be transparent. When you're ghosting and you're fading that way, you're also <laughs> being transparent. You know? A word. <laughs> so y'all got to be clear. How how transparent do you how want me to be? How clear do you want me to be? Yeah. What type? Because yeah. <laughs> I could disappear I could in this invisible, yeah. real fast. <laughs> I'm a ghost. Casper. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> to what you're saying about the like trying to anticipate people's needs and then in advance and figure out how to like get out of that process. I came to the realization recently as someone who is also like, you know, in some ways I think that's connected to like people pleasing um, and like trying to make sure other people are okay. We do all this people pleasing and the people aren't pleased. Like it doesn't work. You know what I mean? If yes. it was effective, then maybe you can make the argument that it's like a useful strategy, but the people are not please like it doesn't it doesn't have the desired effect no nobody's getting help <laughs> and so i'm wondering you know as we think about this this is all more focused on like you know the private inner world and relationship world but creatively how you think about this type of um balance of transparency opacity whether that's in regard to your audience and collaborations like what's the journey been on that of i'm going to confront what I need to confront, not be afraid of that confrontation, but still try to, you know, make things in, in partnership and in collaboration? Yeah, man, that's a great question. I love that segue. I think a lot about how I've been speaking on this more just to myself. If if I ever quote something, it's probably a conversation I had with myself. <laughs> So I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't know. Well, you can set it up like a wise thinker once said. And then, you no, know, literally, I was actually reading this amazing book and it was just my book and my thoughts. <laughs> but one of the things that I've sort of understood music to be is just this very deep, intimate form of like love communication. And what that means to me is like, I've learned so much by the ways that I communicate when like co-collaborating or co-producing. I've learned a lot about communicating through the, that mode, right? So like being like, okay, I hear this thing. Let me grab it now. Let me like talk, speak on it now. Let me adjust it now. And so I feel like it's very parallel to the ways that I've learned to in the moment. I I promise you guys, like, I don't know why we're going to keep coming back to this, but like, I forever have had this thing where like in the moment I would literally have to count like one, two, three, say the thing 
it would be so crazy. Like in my head, I'm like, this person just did this or said this. One, two, three, let me grab it now. And so that also relates to how I've had to find balance between my nine to five over at the reader and also being like, okay, I have this job, but I'm also letting you guys know I'm going to be gone for the month of February. I'll still be working. I just won't be in Chicago because I have things that I'm also tending to in terms of Shawnee Dez music life that I don't want to abandon for, you know, just whatever. It's like, I think I'm more of an asset to all the spaces that I turn up to when I'm bringing all the parts of me with me. So I, yeah. Y'all are really, I just want to name that y'all are so adorable. <laughs> we, we've been out of the flow of doing these like regular ergos for a while. And so we're, we're still finding our sea legs again. Yeah. Love it. But to that point, I really want to actually commend and celebrate you uh, for like the OG listeners. Um, it's been five years since we've had you on, just about. It was, it was July of 2018. Um, and to this point of making space for all of you, what I remember from that conversation a lot was us talking about you finding your sea legs and, through collaboration and through relationship and just like how loving and how open you are to being in space with others. What you have done really in these last two to three years of making space for yourself has been so exciting. You know, there's like the the homey excitement of like, oh man, somebody I know and can see is doing their thing, right? Which you which we all clap and applaud. And then there's like the oh shit, this is raw as hell <laughs> dynamic that like is regardless of me. And like I could not know, you know, fuck me, it don't matter. Just objectively, <laughs> this is like amazing shit that's happening and so i i just want to thank you give you that as we go deeper into where you are your journey in the work particularly daniel was there too um the show you had last the summer spring of 23 at at lincoln hall Mm -hmm. like the the, the transcendent space you made my mama and daddy that ain't really yes. t- ain't together no more we, we had a little family <laughs> date night together it was intergenerational it was it was such a a beautiful space and it was literally you know i just told them like hey my homie's performing this is what i'm doing it's oh we're gonna come um but it was literally one of the best shows i've been to in a really long time and so between that and we'll talk about black joyride and the podcast but it's not a question. This is a, a a flower offering of like you being seen, you being received, you being appreciated, and knowing that it was a journey for you to make that space to show up as all of you. And so it is working. I received that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I received that. Do not bring a tear out of my face oh, oh, today. Oh, oh, I don't want to cry. Oh, oh, I cannot promise that. <laughs> That I shall not commit to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I received that. I remember talking to you after the show. I think I saw you a little bit like after, and I remember later, my yeah. aunt yep. was like, oh my God, I know yeah, his father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mama. love when the aunties uh-huh, and uncles uh-huh, and the grandmas, uh-huh, everybody's uh-huh, included yeah, in my journey. Because yeah, your whole family all coming was there, to the yeah. show. Your whole family, my bro, my Stand family. up. It was there. It was, Stand up. It was a night. <laughs> One thing I noticed as generational is, and y'all can push back on this, I don't think our generation knows how to whistle. We just know how to like snap and and woohoo. Nope. And my dad kept doing the two finger <laughs> under the tug whistle, and he uh-huh. was like holding it down. He, and so, so I want to learn yeah. that. I the other day I was like, yo, before I pass, I have to learn how to do the underhand yeah, whistle. I think, I think the smartphones or something, yeah, like fried it's our brain, taking took, away the, took the saliva out our tongue or something. I don't know. <laughs> but my dad was we proudly drive. and and exuberantly and almost over, overdoing the like after each track he was giving you a big old united center chicago stadium level just like <laughs> pinky index that. finger that's under such the tongue flex, whistle yeah. that's a flex <laughs> the original push notification the whistle like t- what was that exactly yeah. i've been working i can't do the i've been working the, on the, the two thumb, fi- the finger the thumb, thumb. that this thing i'm okay. working on uh here hold on i'm gonna give it give one try one. this is a, a vulnerable moment you ready yes <sighs> I've gotten better than that. That was poor. <laughs> I love this. I love the. <laughs> oh, he did it. Damn. <laughs> this is. Every once in a while, I can walk into it, but it's not. This is you, a pressurized situation. If you're situation. about to give a big, right? It's true. If you're about to give a big whistle, you have to know it's there. Like you, you can't be like, "Well, this is a fifty-fifty shot." And so, you know, consider this in process. 
come back in a couple years. I want to talk about that night a little bit uh, because everything Damon just said is true. And in you talking about like figuring out how to, you know, make room for all the different parts of you. Musically, that was what it felt like. Like it all, it felt continuous. It didn't feel disjointed. But I was like, if someone asked me what quote, like type of show this was, I have no fucking idea what I would say. Like between like mosh pit, head banging, sultry R&B moments, you know, full choir situations. It was like something I hadn't quite experienced before because I've been, you know, there are artists who can do a lot of different things, but that's not what it felt like. Um, they didn't feel like, all right, now it's time for the the soul set and then the rock set. Like it felt, it felt like just different parts of you coming out. And so I'm wondering how that feels as a performer to move between all those modes, because I think we only think about it from an audience perspective sometimes of like, oh, I'm watching different types of perform, but to have your body move between those different types of exuding. Yeah, you, you hit even some metal, like, rawhs. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, no, you got the you growl the in there. A little scream on moment. I think, like, so I will say that even just in this moment, I'm thinking about how much my bandmates have, like, contributed to the level of freedom that I feel to explore all those things. Because for instance, like I remember when I was working with Left Jones a lot, my music was like a lot more soul funk. Real, like that was like the direction that we were going in because that was like the chemistry of that band. Cause they're a band outside of, you know, us performing together. And now the guys that I'm playing with are like Josh Jessen has like this sort of like, uh, I don't know, like almost like Tame Impala type of vibe music that he like more ambient music. You got Elijah and Kurt who are in Trinity Star Ultra. They're making like experimental jazz noise music. And then you got Ryan, who I've been playing with since I was in first grade who has like a gospel and R&B background. So for me, it was every time I would throw an idea out there, they were like, oh, bet, let's make this work. Like, and, and I never really felt that scene, like all the parts of me were okay. Like everything that I wanted to do was okay. And so for me, it was like, I'm in a space that feels safe enough for me to be expansive and to touch on everything that's inspired me. Like I'm super inspired by Tom York, super inspired by Bjork, super inspired by Brandy, super inspired by Little Dragon, like, you know, Hiatus Coyote, like all these different artists that I feel like I can be a sort of like through line of all the things that I picked up from listening to them throughout the years. And it's just, it's okay for me not to be a monolithic uh, uh, artist. Like, it's okay for me not to know the, like, whenever people are like, what type of music do you make? I'm like, look, motherfucker, you got to go press play. You report back to me and tell me what type of music it is because I don't know. Like, I think I always sort of say, like, experimental R&B or exper alt R&B or, but I always reference, like, the things that I'm inspired by. So for me, it feels very natural to be able to do all of those things and have them communicate with each other. And I'm just thankful that it didn't feel like disconjointed. Like I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited that you guys felt that way. Very yeah. jointed. You just mentioned the like uh, feeling of safety to show all those parts and have those received by your bandmates. Were there like particular aspects of that, that you were more nervous about bringing out than others of like, oh, I don't know how they'll take this, you know, if I want to go this direction? I will say like for the reader, the reader on gala that happened in 2022 at the MCA, that was the first time the, the rehearsal the night before that show. I just, they, they started playing real loud on weight. They just got up there and was like, blah, 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 and I was like, Whoa. <laughs> and they was like, they all stopped and looked at me. They said, Hell yeah, Shawnee, like do that tomorrow, like in front of people. Don't be scared to do that. And so it it wasn't a matter of like me ever feeling nervous or intimidated to do it, but it was sort of nice to have 
them sort of like encourage me to, they're like, yo, you do all this crazy stuff in rehearsal. You come up with all these ideas in rehearsal. You're like telling us what to do in rehearsal. Like, let's bring some of those things to the people when we actually perform. And so it's almost like this sense of permission that comes when you have a a safe space to like, to express. And, and so it was never a moment where I felt nervous to do something, but it was like, I needed a nudge or a reminder that I could do it all the time, that I didn't just have to be behind closed doors, doing all these genres, telling them like, Hey, yo, we finna play Hunter. And I want to sing this. And like, y'all, you know what I mean? They're like, yo, like we have to put this in the set. We love the way you perform it. So it's almost like this reminder rather than like I was ever nervous or scared operating from this place of created safety like safety that you built i'm curious how movement fits into there because there and in other times what i've seen is like the way you embody in performance like you know dance but it's it's more than just dancing like there's a there's a, a somatic freedom was that innate or something that you always had? Is that something you had to work towards? Is that part of the process that's connected to the composition? Where does like the physical movement come into play? Amazing question. Y'all are freaking killing it right now. This is so (laughs) cool. We don't even need the answer. We'll just take the praise for it. That's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Next question. (laughs) That was a great question. Good job. I'm I'm satisfied. (laughs) Uh, I think... I love this question so much because for me, the project Moody Umbra, the song that I have that's called Moody, which is like a sort of tick tick, like electronic juke sort of song. Juke is so ingrained in my DNA. It's in my veins, bro. Like I remember the days where we were getting on YouTube and we were watching juke videos. Like, Did you have a squad? We would watch, you know. Were you were part of a <laughs> formal or unofficial troupe of any sort? I wasn't, but I. we all <laughs> loved like House Arrest. You remember it was like House Arrest 1, 2, whatever. And then it was like. Damn, you asked it like it was like a deposition. You're like, are you or have you ever been part of a formal juke squad? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> there's levels. We're I, putting yeah, this in just, the game. The Jew database. <laughs> database. <laughs> the Jew database. No, yeah, I just no, got a place where we at. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it was never anything official, but like I grew up on the South Side. So like at, there was one point, for instance, I'm in seventh grade. I went to school around the corner from where I stay at now at um, Horseman right off 79th and Jeffrey. So you can imagine how like in the culture of Juke, Wallacam, like Rolling, all of these things, that has always been so musical to me. I like I love the T-Pain era. Give me a T-Pain, Dutty Wine, Slow Wine moment and I'm going to juke down. You know, this was crazy. Why were we juking up on boys in seventh grade? Crazy. Don't want to talk about that part. But the reality is that during this project creation, I was like so committed to bringing that in at some point because for me, that was like the through line of like why this song, why this music is moody to me. Like, why is it moody? Talking about the umbra, the shadow, the middle of a shadow, thinking about all of these like subconscious like experiences that I had growing up and then bringing them back and sort of celebrating them and not demonizing them. As I was making the music, I was like, yes, this music is in my body. I feel it in my solar plexus. I feel it in my hips. I feel it in my, you know, root chakra. Um, And that's like where we get the red from. That's where we get the red and black sort of imagery that we had on the inside video. All of it is super, physically is super juke, while it can slow wine, rolling, related. So I love that you brought that up because I feel like a lot of people, I, it, it took me growing up to realize, dang, a lot of people don't really know about Walla Cam. A lot of people don't know about Juke and a lot of people don't really know about the other side of footworking because there's a much feminine side, much more feminine experience and much more, you know, girlhood experience to footworking where the guys are footworking but we are juking, we rolling, you know? And so I think that I'm so, I, I'm just excited that you brought that up because I never have had a space to really talk about that, but that is so in the music. When, when we talking about the Pope, it ain't, it ain't the Vatican. 
<laughs> okay? For, P-O-P-E on the track, and I'm back, and I don't want you to get up on the For those ground. who don't know <laughs> and who are, like, not from the city, in the, the aughts, in the, the early to mid-2000s, there was just this figure that was, like, as hood famous as you could be but only in like 13 <laughs> zip codes. <laughs> and he was the Pope. And the Pope was like the king he of footwork and juke for a good good five to seven years. He yeah. had a good when run. When you saw the Pope, it was like, a th- it was like oh, oh, shit. It's Did the, he have? It's the Pope. Like, <laughs> the Pope. There's like reference. DJ yeah, Nate? DJ Nate. <laughs> Don't make me bring up DJ Nate because they had DJ Nate at Pitchfork, which I thought was wild. Recently? Recently, he was at Pitchfork, I think, either last year or the year before, because he like makes DJ music, like other DJ type, like contemporary DJ music now. Ah, he's still out here. Okay. I, I was worried about DJ Nate. I don't want to talk about it, though. I, oh, my God. Let's not bring up that traumatic. <laughs> stop. 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 Because if you know, yeah, you we'll know. Leave <laughs> Go now, we're going to let this ride out. We're going to let this, this laugh fade out. <laughs> <laughs> no, because wow, yeah, tears are welling in my eyes. There's yeah. no context you're willing to give. You're just gonna let this live. I I give it. I give it. I don't want to. I don't want to spread it more. But he got like, it was like early world star era. Oh, we have yes, we've talked about this. Accosted on the street. Yeah, you remember this? Okay, all right. And then the, and then he was like the warning of there was a, a danger for all West Side superstars that came out of it. But yeah, he got some of his items taken and it wasn't, it wasn't the best. And at that time, you know, like getting your stuff, ta- it, 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 it affected his, his stance in the world for a while. So I'm so excited did, that he's at Pitchfork and he has prevailed. The resilience, I've always the resilience of DJ him. Day. I'm going to stand beside him. I'm going to stand beside him. <laughs> I'm going to stand beside him. <laughs> <laughs> There are going to be no, people you, that you look feel like you got I feel bad. I feel like uh, yeah. <laughs> we are not putting that in the show. Don't notes. look yeah, that. Don't up. do it. But I want to. I want to go to that experience that you were talking about about the that flip side of the juke scene and just talk a little bit more about like when you say that. What are you imagining? What are you envisioning? Like, what was that world that you were part of that feel like informed so much of this music? Absolutely. Um, the more that we talk about it, the more that things come through where I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why I named Rinky Rinky. So the song named Rinky on my project, Moody Umbra, is from the rink. So um, it's a song that to me is like super you driving down Lakeshore Drive, summertime shy, you just cruising and you just letting the music sort of progress as you get through like this sort of the sun is maybe low. It's like golden hour. You on your way to the crib and you just like sliding back to the house. That's called Rinky because I wanted to sort of nod to the fact I grew up in the rink era. Like I grew up when we were going to the rink for juke parties, for juke jams. They would have a juke jam on some Saturdays. Um, And then, like, on Wednesdays, my dad would low-key take my sisters and I to the rink to go skating. So I was there, like, you know, pretty often. I remember when Jeremiah came and performed when, y'all, it's dark. Because why the fuck was he performing birthday sex? But he he must not have been that much older at that point, though. For teenagers, it was crazy. So when I think about all those things, no, he wasn't that much older. No, he He couldn't have College age. Look, I'm not here to condone birthday sex on any level but i'm just i'm just saying like in the timeline he wasn't that removed from being jeremy at that point (laughs) is my my thought you know no 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 i agree with you i think that um i think like all in all like i think there are ways that i can look at both sides of this but take away so much more to celebrate because those memories like even just having someone like him come to the rink, being from Chicago, it really did. Don't say it, Damon. Just don't let it happen. Is he? Is he like forty five? No, you leave it alone. Don't tell me. No, no, <laughs> I, I'm just doing the math. He's probably like twenty three. Yeah, born in eighty seven. The song came out oh eight, oh nine. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's an adult. Yeah, he's an adult for sure. And I was in eighth grade going to high school, which, yeah, mind you, he wasn't in the crowd. We we didn't talk to him, nothing like that. It was just that was the single that was out at the time. The kids was singing it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we knew the song. We knew the song. We knew the song. And so it's more the booking agent. It, that's, it was that's the booking agent. The, the former general manager at the rink. Exactly. The former general manager, we need to speak. Let's go ahead and get HR on the call. But I think that experience and like experiences like 
uh, people having like basement parties, people having parties for their birth, like birthday parties growing up for me were, especially in like the seven to freshman year of high school was definitely like juke parties. Like people would bring a speaker, they would have their iPod or something put up to the thing or CD, make CDs. I grew up in the mix CDs era. I remember when you had the CD changer on the laptop, I was burning CDs down. Let me make you a mix. And you write it on there. You write the hearts and the stars. My big sister, I used to steal her mix CDs. But for me, the other side of footworking that I feel like never has had its like full sort of like all of Chicago knows about it is the juke era and the rolling era and rolling is like a move that you do with your hips. So you're rolling your hips. It's almost like belly dancer, but a little bit more with a tick tick. Wow. To it. it is belly dancer. It is. I've never made that, that connection. Absolutely. It is for the show. Actually, I was talking to Myra. I'm like, do you got to find me a sorry? Because I'm trying to really show them that I'm belly dancing on stage. I wanted to be clear that this is what this is. And she was like, gee, I don't know if we're going to be able to find one in so short notice. There was a lot of production needs for that. She she hit you with, sorry, we can't do that. (laughs) Sorry, no, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, no, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Shout out to Myra. But it's like, for shout out to Myra. We love Myra. So thankful for her. She really got on her organizer, her her organized. She was in her organizing bag when we were pulling together, getting people out to the show. Like that was when I was like, yeah, I got me one. Go ahead. Yeah, you do. You do. My flex. I have a flex because she hit, she like sent the message out as soon as like tickets went available. And by the time she hit me, I had already, she said I was the first one to buy tickets. Period. I think she did tell me this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tr- that is a flex. Just, 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 to let you know. just to let you know. That is a flex. Because she, she was flex. like, just, it's that already is... out. And I was like, I felt so and, like, oh, and when you send the message, you're, message you're, you're, you're waiting monitoring that Eventbrite, too. Yeah. Like, you're like waiting for that result to yeah. come in, my, you know? My, yeah. <laughs> my thumbs are strong of like, already <laughs> got them. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for, for doing that. Because I was like, there was a moment where I was like, dang, you know, we couldn't have kind of close. Because it, we only did the show a month after the project came out. And I was like, I don't know if, you know, you questioning all the things. The like, oh, no one's going to show up feeling. I feel like that never goes away. I feel like people who still sell arenas have that feel of like, what if it's half full? What if I can't do Like, because that does happen to people. Like the bigger room you get, eventually you can't feel that. Like, yeah, scary. That shit is and, harrowing. But I think it's also like, we know that they're like, we know that we're sharing ears with so many other people, so many other musicians, so many other podcasts, so many other, like everyone is trying to really show up for all their community members. And at some point it feels like, dang, like I know, at least that's the way that I think of it. It's never a thought that like people are just going to choose not to support me, but I'm always thinking about the bandwidth and capacity of people who are showing up and supporting so many other artists supporting themselves, supporting their family. Like, you know, life is big. Life is big. That's a very generous understanding that I think comes with time and having done this for a while is like, it's not because they don't like me. It's because like life is hard and people are tired. With that said, that room was crazy packed and the energy was insane. And it felt like we can talk about other things other than that one night of your life, but I missed that day. I loved it. I was wondering, like, how long that um, that electricity lasted for you, because it seemed like a special one. Because, like, it seemed like every one of your best friends from every point in your life was there. Yo, that was crazy. Seeing homies from I went to all girl Catholic super white high school, Mother Macaulay, um, for three years, and seeing some of them pull up. I was like gagged. I'm like, yo, like this is too much for my heart to handle. I had chorus with y'all. Like we were in chorus singing oh, no, no, no. <laughs> together. And now I'm dusty winding on stage for y'all. I love it. Someone described like the actual definition and difference between introvert and extrovert. Somewhere down the line, I'm like, low key, I might be an introvert. But we'll talk about that later because I don't have the definition of what they said that made me 
reconsider that. But when I'm around a lot of people that I love, I could have not had any, nothing, no substance, no CBD, no liquor. My vibe is like through the roof and I'm acting drunk. Like I'm literally drunk off energy. And that's how I felt that night. Like to the point where I was like, dang, low key. Like I, I feel like I've only been on stage for 20 minutes only to realize that the show is like an hour and some change or something. And I was like, okay, I need to let these people go home. Um, <laughs> let me go and let them go. But that lasted for, I would say like that really took me through the entire summer. And it's still something that I sort of tap into when I need a little jolt of just thinking about literally almost everybody in that crowd I knew or have had a conversation with or it that was something that meant so much to me that I was like, dang, like I'm looking at all these faces and I'm thinking about everybody's traumas. We've talked about traumas, everybody in this crowd. We've talked about like deep things and and it just felt so amazing to have that sort of connection to the people that we're supporting something that I put out into the world. It's like, I was just telling a friend, like, whenever I say that, it's like, was it a friend or was it me? <laughs> but for real, though, no, it was a friend this time. <laughs> I, was just, I was just telling a friend that, like, it's really important as someone who is a Chicago born and based artist to, like, you can never get to that point where it's like, I'm above the people that support me. And I think once you try to start doing that, that's when you see a huge disconnect. And it's like, nah, like this is wild because I am like a part of everybody in this room. I have some deep connection with, and that feels good to me. You know, when people like blow up and they like, oh, as a black artist, my whole audience is only white. And I'm like, yeah, because you've started to disconnect from the people who supported you and, you know, lifted you to where you are. And I never want to get to that, that, that point. And that night was like such a staple and a reminder of like how many communities I'm tapped into. Like I had white homies. I had my, my Puerto Rican, Mexican homies. I have my black homies. I had everybody who I've like shared space with. He was like, all my homies here. It wasn't my show. And I had a similar experience. I was like, I know every, yeah, yeah. It was it was cool because I had my parents there, and so you know they they know you know what your we parents know, what we was do, like, but it like it made me look like every time somebody was like, yeah, oh Damon, oh how you doing? Oh man, these my parents. Oh man, here. nice to meet you. Oh your son's great. It was just like, oh yeah, this is this is really affirming. This is a great space. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great show, and you know, great great intermission between acts for me. I'm really enjoying that part too. Yeah, I think that experience brings me so much it's it is electrifying and like when it's you're in that moment of doubt and you're thinking about all right was what we doing how we doing this and you know I'm not seeing any sort of like bigger industry support and I'm like yo my lane my my path is gonna always be centered around community it's something that I will never want to get away from like I want that to always be an integral part of my journey and I think about that night as like a beacon of that, a, a reminder of that. So, yeah. Speaking of community building, in addition to releasing this amazing project and being the singer songwriter that you are, you are also the creator and curator and organizer of the Black Joyride, which I would love folks to just hear the, the origin story of and what it's grown to. And as somebody who participated this past Juneteenth, again, just want to commend and celebrate not only the like, oh damn, this is a a cornucopia of homieship. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, th- there really was a was a very uh, it, it let us breathe. We use the language of well pro, but there was really a, a very intentional culture of care and wellness and protection, and making sure folks were not just given the information to take care of themselves and for their own safety, but equipping folks to help take care of each other. Um, and so you could talk about that particular ride, but, uh, you know, the project in itself, what is Black Joy Ride? How did it come into existence and what, how do you see it playing in with this community building and how maybe that connects to you as an artist? hundred percent. Yeah. So Black Joy Ride, love, I, I love sort of how it's taken on its own 
thing. Like, you know, some people literally only know me because Black Joyride. They don't even know me. They're just like, we fuck with Black Joyride. And I'm like, that's so cool. And I love that. So I used to do After School Matters. And I worked with uh, West Town Bikes, Alex Wilson, who runs West Town Bikes over on Western and Division. I was like a teacher for after school programs over the summer, helping kids like learn basic bike knowledge, you know, taking them on rides, going to some of the CPS schools and working with them, um, whatever. It was super cool. And I was like, yo, like this is fire. I always wanted to be like a cyclist chick. Like I always wanted to have like the fit and just the gears and it is a it is a low key very cool lane. It's a cool lane unless they bicycle have bicycle chick with the yeah. Okay, Chicago, listen up. <laughs> and no, but th- I love I love that you bring that up because like that was such a big part. So I was doing that in like 2018, 2019, right? So just before the pandemic, and then once 2020 hit, I was still you know that spring I was riding my bike a little bit, blah blah. blah. But as things sort of continue to pick up socially and politically, you know, I'm really making space to talk about mental health here, but I was like in a deep, 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 deep depression. And I was like so dark and I was feeling so hopeless. So like, I was feeling so isolated in that moment too, in that depression. Cause I didn't want to like put it on other people. And I remember calling, I had three homies, three of my guy homies that I just like, I love them so deeply. Those are my brothers. I don't have any blood brothers. I have two step brothers, and I got like seven, eight sisters. Crazy. And I remember calling Jamil Bridges, David Mabry, and Fem, Femi, Fem Dot. And these were all different times. I was probably just boohoo sobbing on the phone. Like, yo, like I'm just feeling stuck. I'm feeling dark. I feel like don't nobody understand like what this this moment is thinking about how the pandemic is also affecting the deep seated racism that has always been very prevalent in this world, in this society, and how all of these things felt like they were just crashing down at the same time. And I was looking around, I was freaking hopeless. And I remember, like, I think David pulled up on me. He was like, forget it. Like, I'm just going to take a trip out. I'm about to pull up on you. Let's just sit outside. Let's talk. And David is also a, like, super avid a cyclist. We've gone on super long rides together. In that moment of us talking and him pulling up on me and us being outside, I was like, you know what? If I'm feeling like this, I can almost bet that so many other people are feeling like this. And so I'm just going to get some homies to pull up. I didn't eat y'all. I thought it was going to be 20 people. It's 20 of us. We riding down the street. I pull up. It's like 200, 150, somewhere around there, people that pulled up downtown on Michigan. We pulled up at the Jet, the former Jet Magazine building, because I was like, we got to make this blackity black, 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 right? And it was during Juneteenth. We're going to literally go go to Ebony. <laughs> Pull up on at Ebony. I literally, in the, in the organizing stage, I said, look, we pulling up on Ebony. We passing the Great Migration Monument. We going to go down to DuSable. This was all around Juneteenth. And for me, it was like, it was like that literal thing that I swear, I, I try not to swear to God, but I swear to God, it was like that one thing that I was like, yo, you got to kind of stand up at this moment. Like when it feels so heavy and so daunting, that's the moment where you literally put your knees together and you try your hardest to stand up. And that was kind of that, that was that moment. Like I remember homies pulled up with CPR training, homies pulled up with first aid kits, tool kits. People was pulling up with water, with snacks. Like they was like, yeah, like let's, let's get behind this and do this together. And I was like, all right, bet. Now we got to keep doing this to like, just be, let this be a monument to this, to this time, this moment. Let us not forget, you know, that we were all going through this, but also the significance of riding South was because a lot of the critical mass rides only happen on the North side. They don't really come south. And I've been in critical mass rides. I've been in other um, critical mass like rides that are not necessarily called that. And I had, had the experience. Just masses that were critical, not capital C, capital M critical Exactly. <laughs> in this instance, I was absolutely critical because there's another bike ride group that 
people love, and I loved when I went on that ride, but I saw how they like low key was like, if you get left behind, you get left behind. And I was like, yo, like, I don't, I don't love that. And I, I think a lot about how a lot of this work was so that we can lean towards helping the South side become more bikeable, helping the South side, the West side become more accessible to people who literally, yo, there's so many people that I live by that that ride the bus. And it's like, yo, like, yeah, you could low-key ride your bike. And a lot of times I would have people be like, yo, like I never really rode my bike in the street before. And for me, something that was so powerful was like, the first ride that I went on was a group ride. I used to ride with Party Noir when they had this bright group called Two Wheel Gods, and then they changed it to Hold the Lane. They were super instrumental and inspiring in this Black Joy ride. Like the first rides that I was doing, I hit them up and I was like, hey, yo, I need some marshals. Like, would y'all be down to pull up? They all pulled up. Marshals are the people who like keep us sort of encaved and safe on our ride. They block off traffic. When a red light, when a green light changes red, they put their bodies in the front of cars to ensure that the whole group stays together and get through. And for me, that is important because when you're thinking about biking in an area that is not used to seeing cyclists, they don't know what the rules of the road are in terms of like you low key, the cyclist has the right of way because they're like a pedestrian on two wheels. And you low key need to respect them because you can kill them because you are in a motor vehicle. And so with that, it became really important to me to put up those, not only just telling people what they could do to help themselves, but it's like, nah, we finna show y'all and we gonna do it with y'all. So yeah, that's sort of like the origin of the of the Black Joy Ride. And then we put up at Dusable. We like had snacks and stuff. That second year we put up at Dusable. We had music. We had more food. The third year was the year that um, Chance had that thing at DuSable. We pulled up there. I performed. We had a section. We like ate food and blah, blah, blah. Last year, we did it again. This year, we're going to do it again. And I'm low-key trying to start. I'm going to say this here so it's like a I have witnesses. <laughs> I'm starting a aunties and uncles cookout that's going to be like, Pull up to the cookout, even if you don't ride. Come to the cookout, bring your grill, bring your stuff. Because I'm tired of people telling us that we, the generation that's not contributing to the culture of cookouts. And it's like, we tired, okay? I just want to put that out there. We tired. But Juneteenth weekend, Aunties and Uncle Cookout is going to be the first annual one after the Black Joy Ride this year. And we're going to keep doing it forever and ever and ever. Bring your nieces, your nephews, your grandma, your mama. I needed that reference here so that if anybody tried to take my idea... It was here. Aunties and uncles. <laughs> it's on the it, on the record. And to the aunties and uncles listening, now you know where you're gonna need now you know where you're gonna need to be. I love the way that this continues to evolve while being, like you said, like a monument or a in some ways like commemoration of the feeling that birthed it. Right. We've been talking a lot with people about what they make out of grief and grief being an entry point. And I think those are kind of like, you know, two sides of the coin of the weight and depression and darkness that you're talking about feeling is there was this immense multifaceted grief. And thinking about that, not just as a motivator, but as like an, as an ingredient of making things that are beautiful and that last because that's such a profound kind of origin story for it. And so you just described what the ride is for other people. I'm curious for you, like, what does it come to mean in regard to that moment that it was birthed out of? Yeah, for me, a, a word that I've been using so much is like alchemy and learning to alchemize what I'm given and like these feelings of like hopelessness and uh, these moments that that sometimes feel like drowning, how am I able to sort of stand up and and take something from that experience and and make something beautiful? And I think in totality, like that's what art is, right? Like a lot of artists are super emo people, like they're turn around and die ass people, and they continually like make something beautiful out of the cards they were dealt. And for me, it it is a, a signifier of mobility, right? And not mobility when you're thinking like vertical mobility, but I'm thinking more of horizontal, expansive mobility of like continuing to move. Like even if you don't know in which direction you're going in, continue, like keep moving, keep moving in the sense that is like 
when it feels like you can't, and I, and I don't say this physical, I, I think I have to make this point because we live in this like productivity ass era. When I'm thinking of mobility, I'm thinking of like, when it feels like you want to close yourself off and shut yourself off and close your heart off and and stop looking at, for instance, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Sudan, what's happening in Congo. Like when you want to really like lay down and give up, that's the moment that you actually should be maybe having a conversation, should be maybe journaling, should be maybe turning on something that brings you back to yourself, that that introduces you back to yourself. And for me at that moment, it was cycling. For me at that time, it was like, I remember how I felt as a shorty on my bike. I remember what it felt like to um, take new wind on a new block. When I was old enough to ride around the block, baby, that was the biggest jolt of freedom I ever felt in my life. They was like, all right, you go around the corner. You big enough now. I said, let's ride. And so, <laughs> and so for me, it was like thinking about mobility in the physical sense where your wheels are spinning, right? But then also on that metaphysical, emotional level is like the work is not done. It's not going to be done probably in this lifetime. And there are moments where rest is needed and you should always prioritize that. But for me, it means mobilizing and getting together as a big group to show that like we're stronger in our numbers and we shouldn't isolate ourselves in our depression. We shouldn't isolate ourselves in our fear. That's when we actually need to be talking to each other and getting together. And so, yeah, and to what Damon said earlier, like people hang out and talk after and they you know, link up with people that are in their community. They meet somebody new and that's like such a big part of it as well. So what you just described is what we would call Risparian. We've built a little ethos over here. Yeah, yeah, Love yeah. That. So um, we, we've launched a new like umbrella organization entity called Respair, Respair Production and Media. And the word Respair is an antiquated 16th century word that means a return to hope and a recovery from despair. Wow. I'm getting it tatted. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the process of returning. It doesn't mean optimism. <laughs> I, we, we need to clip this because like what you just named and described, and there's so many, you know, you can journal, you can sing, you can ride a bike, you can sit on a porch. Um, there are so many ac- actions or activities that can be part of this process of this return. Uh, but but the way you named it with intention, I just want to thank you, um, not only for for sharing the learning, but for being so vulnerable about the origin and about, you know, the the difficulty and the despair that you survived and experienced. Um, and yeah, just appreciate your honesty around that. And I also want to shout out the homies. Um, I don't know Jamil, much love to, to Fem Dot, but I really want to shout out David. Uh, not only for pulling up in that story, uh, but David, you know, David don't got no mixtape or nothing, but David been around kiss. You might've met him once or twice. You might, might recognize him if you've seen him, but, but he's just, he's just a beautiful spirit. And I I met him probably, probably close to 10 years ago now. Um, and I want to commend him for the way he showed up to you is something I've observed about him. Uh, to, to be honest and transparent, I try not to do this in every conversation, but I feel like it always comes up. I have been in a place of despair or really dispirited about the ways in which men take space, interact, the impact and lack of accountability um, that, you know, that has felt collectively harmful. Um, but it is Risperian when I see someone like David because I kind of always see him in loving, caring relationship to Black women and as a friend um, and showing up and taking care of people and being kind and, and just even an energy, right? Like, it's, and we don't got to get all into the politics or the you know, social behavior, uh, but just energetically, I can be very turned off by my peers, uh, and especially Black men of my age. And yeah, this for a decade now, I, just, I hope he hears this, like, you know, let, let Yo, I'm going to make like, sure he hears. Yeah, for, for a decade now, the way he's shown up has been something that really has comforted me and, um, I commend and I'm proud of. So I'm I've shout out to him at large, but definitely in that story, just like pulling up on the porch, riding a bike with you, and then you look up and it's 200 people, and then you got t-shirts and the whole thing, and, you have to <laughs> and water, get, get, yeah, get a Twitter page and all types of shit, you know, because yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 you got an EPK around it. So okay, became uh, yeah. party big part of your life, you know, yeah. Shout out to the Black Joy Ride. Shout out to David <laughs> and shout out to you for, for coming to such a Risperian creation. Mm. from from a real place i say i do think mobility 
whether that's physical or nothing, but the, the physical act of moving yourself in whatever way is able can be a really important piece of that. I think that's just a good reminder for me, especially in the cold days that we're in when we're recording this now. Like, that's so important. I, and I, real quick, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate that you said that about David. Like, that's really one of my, you know how you meet people and you like know that they're supposed to be on your soul journey. Like, David is my literal brother. Like, he will pull up to my crib. I'm snuggled in a bed. He just standing at the door and we talking. And he like, all right, I'm gonna let you go back to sleep. Love you. I'm gonna see you later. And it's always been just so respectful. And he is actually my partner in the Black Joy ride. So he actually helps every single ride. He is at the foundation of like, we get together, we have this type of meeting we talk about where to start. He maps out everything. So shout out to David. I love you, bro, for life, G. And in the next life and in the next life, I swear, I hope we get to keep doing it. So respair is a, is a word and a philosophy, but it's also a production entity around community facing liberatory media. And you are in that lane now. So we want to make sure before we get out of here to talk about the podcast. So, you, you know, you released the project, you got Black Joy Ride, and now we have the new podcast. What's going on with that? Yo, so yes, we have the sit down hosted by Shawnee Dez, brought to you by the Chicago Reader. Um, shout out to the reader for, I keep saying this, shout out to the reader for making my talk show host a reality. And I keep saying that I've been talking to myself for so many years and now it's paying off. Um, so it's like, yo, just wherever you are, whoever's out there, keep talking to yourself, keep doing what you're doing. At some point it's going to pay off. But yeah, the, the, the premise around the sit down hosted by Shani Dez is to amplify and get a deeper behind the scenes sense of Chicagoans, uh, creatives, uh, people who are in the uh, social activist sphere, people who own coffee shops, like all those type of things, all the things that are Chicago, um, speaking with them on a, a a deeper level, going more into like what their origin story is, how they came to their work, their practice, and really giving that POV to the greater, you know, not only the Chicago land people, but also the, the world at large. So I'm excited to be doing that as, again, as a beautiful mushy gushy moist water sign <laughs> that was disgusting i'm sorry <laughs> just a i'm picturing like a squishy microphone a water and like the seat is real like <laughs> waterlogged so fast <laughs> that was a, a so peak fast. and a fall but the yeah. waterbed you know <laughs> But it it seems like it's anyway. We don't have to talk about water beds. Let's talk about your brand new show. How has it felt stepping into the the host seat and, and figuring out how to do this this uh this other side of the microphone? Yeah, I feel like y'all know this. Like I think there's such a huge creative aspect that goes into curating conversation, right? So when you know you're having a guest on, you're intentional about who you're asking to pull up what sort of setting. So this show is also space-based. We always go into the space of the person we're talking to so that we sort of have that added uh, third character element that is the space. Again, nod to my Cancerian nature. I love people's cribs. I love to see where people get cozy at. But it it has been, it's been a very natural transition. Like I think aside from being a musician, an artist, a a facilitator. I like to talk. Y'all, I mean, people that are listening to this, you guys, these are just little tips of the edge, tips of the iceberg answers. I could talk about all these different things for hours and hours. And I sort of found myself doing that all the time with people. And I'm like, yo, I got to press record because there's some gems in here that I feel like other people might be just interested in enjoying. Like they might just want to hear this or it might be something right, right space, right time that they hear something. Um, and it was something that they needed to hear. So yeah, it's been supernatural sort of transitioning into that. I've hosted or moderated panels and things like that before and had a really good time doing that. It's all a genre of performance in, in the way that it's like you're channeling information and you're curating space and you're holding space for energy to flow and circulate in the, in a, in a space. So yeah, it feels really natural. It definitely like from the outside makes a lot of sense. Like knowing you, the conversations we've had, I'm like, 
if you were to ask me who who have I seen on stage who should be sitting down in a studio talking to people, it makes perfect sense it would be you. So very excited to hear what you make there. And of course, if there are ways we can help or be thought partners or, you know, if you have questions, not that we have all the answers, but we've been doing this for a little while and may have thoughts and things we can bring. So look to us as a resource. And listeners, go go subscribe now to The Sit Down, hosted by Shawnee Des, wherever you get your pods. Thank you. And also, I want to say, because I know that this was like a, a, a both sided thing. I want to just say how much I appreciate you guys as two guys. I don't know how you identify, but in the in the bigger sphere, just having this sort of um, beautiful masculine nature and energy that has always felt very safe. And has always felt very um, expansive and and down to clown and down to talk. Like, just you know, like you got. I, I think I'm trying to do that a lot more, where I actually tell people I really appreciate you outside of your work as just regular as human beings. But also, I'm so thankful for the space that you take up and the space that you make um, within this uh, within the Chicago cultural community. If it weren't for examples like ergo examples like when I mentioned Party Noir and just all the things that I've seen, I don't know if it would feel as possible without having those really beautiful examples of uh, of folks who are just making waves and doing it in a way that is dignified and loving. And and it's like you're not just making waves to be big. Y'all are making waves to have big arms that, you know, grab around as many people as you can. So I love and appreciate y'all for that. Thank y'all. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Yeah, that does mean a lot. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep uh down the clown. Definitely <laughs> we're down the clown and break it down. Like I think I think that's something that's gonna stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 no that that does really mean a lot and is is really affirming. So so thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely yeah, come from you that's special. Before we get out of here, how can people find you and your work in the ways you'd like to be found? Yes, definitely don't try to find me on Twitter because it got hacked and deleted. And I also be saying too much on Twitter. So whatever. But now you can find me on threads because I do be talking shit on threads. Please pull up there. Y'all can find me if you live in Chicago. I kind of am trying to be outside a little bit more in a way that is safe. I have my mask on when I go outside, but I, I love seeing people in the wild. You can also find me um, at shawneedez.com. You can find me at shawnee De- underscore dez on Instagram. Um, I have a TikTok now. It's mostly just a Sphinx fan page because I have a Sphinx named Kuji Chagulia. I love her. She's my baby. I call her Kuji for short. Great cat name. I love just calling her ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn that's that's a good one that's that's top yeah. level yo i was yeah. very at, at first i was supposed to get the runt of the litter so i was like yo you made it to this life you earth size self-determination you know i had to give her put it on her and then they gave me a different cat and i was like and still you rose <laughs> <laughs> you still were born you know it's still impressive you're still here <laughs> and so now you my baby kuji spelled like k-u-j-i not c-o-o-g-i which i love too so yeah, y'all can find me at all those places. You can also find when you look for the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We're going to put it in other spaces, but those are the first two spaces. Like low key, the next episode will probably be everywhere. Just type in Shawnee Des in the, in the podcast thing and you'll see it pop up. It's a beautiful blood orange cover. Shout out to the reader. Thank you to them for, you know, really just being like, yo, this person be talking a lot. So let's just press play. <laughs> Um, so yeah, those are all the spaces. And of course, go listen to the music. The album is out everywhere. Oh, yeah, now. Moody Umbra. It's damn good too. Thank um, you. and if you ever see the as as probably came through, if you ever have the opportunity to go see Shawnee on stage, do it. All right, let's uh let's hop out of here. Thank you again for being here and sharing your your voice and wisdom and kindness and joy. We're at Ergo Radio and at Respair Media. Uh, get in tune like comment subscribe all that good stuff and we'll be back reshaping the culture for the more liberatory and creative much love to the people peace out peace